Okay, so today we're going to play around with expressions. So this is a little bit of navel gazing, I guess, where we really like programming languages. So we're going to use our programming languages to implement programming languages. Mm. So if, if you do like it, then it's great. If not, then it's doubly bad in some sense. But, uh, and, and this little language here is sometimes called Hutton's Racer after Graham Hutton, who's a professor in Nottingham. Connor, you want to, to tell an anecdote? I, guess? Uh, I suppose. Um, so uh, Graham has a long series of uh, uh, pieces of work exploring various different uh, semantic phenomena uh, and how they show up in the compilation of programs. And he has a methodology that he brings to all of these uh, situations where he starts from a very simple programming language that just has these two components in it. So the idea is that uh, numbers represent finished values. That, I mean, their, their job is to be kind of to stand for anything that might be the output. And uh, adding up stands for uh, any computation that just works on values and doesn't do anything weird. Right, that definitely uh, succeeds in delivering a value. Right, you can add two numbers; you're going to get a number. So, um, so the numbers stand for values of any sort. The adding up stands for ordinary computation that works. Yes. Uh, uh, no. So the, yeah. So he's um, uh, so he starts from a language. It's sort of the simplest thing that that just about goes and doesn't do anything terribly exciting. And then he adds in some more features that are the stuff he wants to investigate. So maybe one day it's exceptions and uh, another day it's mutable state or whatever it happens to be. Um, and today for us it's, it's if then else. Right? Yes. So we want to add something that makes it a little bit interesting. So we have numbers and addition. And then we want to add everything else, but that, that means we also need to add in booleans, right? Well, it doesn't need to, you could imagine if zero or something like this, but, yeah. but let's add in booleans. So we have numbers, booleans, addition, and if then else. We have addition, and then a happy branch, and a sad branch, right? Depending on if you're true or not. Um, okay, and then the first thing we would like to do is we would actually like to take this. So this is just data, right? This is just syntax. It's a data type. So it's built up. It doesn't mean anything. It's just a way to construct expressions. So maybe we should do an example expression. Example one, which is an expression. And I can say this is number five plus number seven. So why does this work? It's because the plus e thing here takes two expressions and gives me an expression, right? Where the underscores go. So I put you also do plus uh, bit. Uh, right. So I can do example two. In example one. Uh, right. Uh. But I, I'd like to keep this a separate example because it's a good one. Yes. So I can say bit true plus the number seven. See, I'm just happy with this as well. So not all of the expressions we can down, write down actually makes much sense, right? And that's going to become important. Right now, we could say if e double five plus double seven, then yeah, bit true plus double yes. five else bit three plus double seven. So let's write down an example with an f. So if e, and then I can do something sensible. False. Right now you could generate a similar one. Yeah. But it doesn't even though we, we 
name these things very suggestively, it doesn't really mean anything so far, right? It's just, just some names we picked. Yeah. The, the only thing that matters is that if you have three expressions, you get the new one by using this if then else. Yeah. 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 Um, so the first thing we probably want to do with this is we want to take this syntax and interpret it as something meaningful. Right? So this is usually called evaluation because we get values out of the expressions. And then here I've already defined a data type of values because if you think a little bit, a value is either a natural number or a boolean. Right? So I have to put this into one thing so that I can say for every expression I should get a value. So this is just a fancy co-product, this is union, right? It's either a number or it's a bit, but I'll name this a little bit more suggestively. Yeah. Uh, yes, so I could also have written this as prime yes. and B plus. Uh, and you see it's, okay, I haven't imported stuff, so I couldn't do that. If I imported plus, do the exact same would be exactly the same thing, except that num would be called inch one and bit would be called inch two. Okay, so let me try and write this evaluation, which takes an expression and gives me back a value. So how do I do it? Take an expression in, and then I have no choice. Oops. Uh, so that was the microphones dying, so I'm going to try and actually dub this over afterwards and I'm sure it's going to be hilarious at some point. So what I was trying to say was that we have to pat match an E, so let's do that. And then let's also change the names of these things a little bit. So let's call this E prime and E double prime and then I'm going to realize that actually ET for the true branch here is better name and EF for the false branch. So after we've done that bit of trivial things, we can actually start to pattern match. So what should we do here in the num case? We are given a natural number n, and we have to produce a value. Well, probably we should use, we have to use one of these two constructors, so probably we should use the num one, right? Because we have a natural number. And similarly here for the bit, we should use the bit constructor. A little bit of overloading there. Uh, you could think maybe auto could actually find this for you, so let's try. And indeed, it does. Uh, that's not at all obvious, because you could also produce many other values here, right? Num0 or num17, or what have you. Um, but okay, let's look here at the plus case. Here is where things are starting to get a little bit interesting. So we're given two expressions, e and e prime. And we would like to add them together, right? But so far, this is your syntax, and we have to convert it into values before we can add it. So let's see. Um, I'm talking about something else here on the screen, which I can't remember what it was, but I'm sure it was very important. Um, talk a little bit more, pointing to values and pointing to other things. Um, but all in all, we would like to do this recursively, right? So let's see if we can do that. So if we try to evaluate E recursively, then we get the value. And of course, we could do the same thing with E prime. But the problem is we don't know what this value is yet, right? It could be a num or it could be a bit. And actually, a little bit of foreshadowing, if it is a bit, then like here in expression 2, then, then that really is a problem, right? So let's see what happens. So we need some way of adding values together. So let's make a function that does this. Takes a value and another value and produces a value. Okay. And how are we going to define this? Well, we better do it by pattern matching, like always, right? So let's do that. Um, but first, let's see if we can deploy it. So we could try to do the recursive call on E and then on E prime. Um, that's just going to work, right? Okay, so now you just have to define this thing and we do a little bit of renaming. That's fine. And then here in the good case, we can return another number and we can actually add the n and the m prime together. So these are now real natural numbers 
that we can add, right? They're not just syntax coming from expressions. So that's great. Uh, but all of these other cases are actually quite problematic, right? Because we don't know what to do here. We don't know what to do if you're trying to add a number to a bit. So what can we possibly do about this? Well, it doesn't look so easy, right? So we probably have to think of something else to do. And what can we possibly do? Um, Okay, we do a bit of thinking. Probably we had a bit of a discussion in the room. But after this thinking, we realized that it's just too much to say that for every expression we can compute a value because look up here, we had some expressions that actually weren't values. So let's just say that we can maybe produce a value instead. And then what do we have to do? Well, we have some good cases and we just have to insert some justs uh, to say that we really produce a value here. And then we're going to have some, some not so good cases. So the first thing that we need to do Okay, so now we have to actually produce a maybe a value. So let's put the just in front of the num and the just in front of the bit. Okay, and then this plus here is only maybe going to produce a value as well, right? Okay, so then we need to put the just here as well. But we see here that actually we don't know if these things succeeded or not, right? These are the recursive calls and they are maybe going to produce a value. But for now, let's just leave a hole for all of that and finish off the definition of plus. Because actually, we already covered the only good case that we care about. And all the other cases, uh, we have nothing sensible to add. I mean, you could try to do something cute. If you try to add two bits together, then maybe you take the or or something like this. But that's not actually going to be helpful for us. So let's just say that in all other cases, we are just going to return nothing. Right, so that's, that's failure for us, right? Okay, um, so still we can't just give this because the recursive calls here again are producing maybes, but the values that are coming into plus are pure values. Uh, so the good thing to do here is to use do notation and then do this a little bit at a time so that we only care about the happy path. So the first thing we do is we say do and now we are going to evaluate the first argument, e. Uh, so what's happening behind the scenes is that this is using the bind for maybe, which is going to go on as long as we find a just and just make the whole thing to a nothing if we find nothing. Okay, so we evaluate the first e, and we see here in the goal, we now have a value v, uh, because we're assuming we're on the happy path. And then we can do the same thing for e prime, so we get a value v prime, if only we finish this. Okay, and you see that I'm uh, kind of working outside of the hole because the Emacs mode is not so good with the notation, so I add one line at a time. Okay, so now we say we have a v and a v prime, and now we can pass these in to the plus function, right? And, and that's fine. And why did I not need a return or anything like this? It's because the, the plus v itself is actually returning a maybe, right? Okay, now we can do the same thing for the if then else. Um, okay, there's some yellow here that I'll try to get rid of by it's just a remnant of, of the previous display. So if I retype it, it goes away. Annoying, but that's life. Um, okay, so what about the if? So here we want to do something similar again, right? So uh, we would like to first evaluate the e and then do something based on this. So we're going to do a do. We are going to evaluate the e, going to get some value v, hopefully. If not, the whole thing is going to return nothing. And we see that v is a value. But again, we don't really, we're not happy just to have a value here. It needs to be a very special value, right? It has to be a bit. Otherwise, we don't know what to do with the if then else. So let's just pattern match on it and say, well, it's better be a bit. 
But if we now reload, then we see that the serving the so we, we get told off for just treating the, the bit pattern and not the num pattern. That's what the incomplete pattern matching says. So let's treat it. Uh, yes, say where after the the line in the, in the clause, and then we write another pattern. So now x here represents what happens if we are not matching the bit. And because our values are nums or bits, then actually here we could pattern match more than we uh, Yes, say, okay, but if it's not a bit, then it's a num, right? Uh, and then we have to say what to do when we get a num here in, in gold one. But in fact, we don't care about what this is. Uh, we are going to return nothing all the time, so this pattern matching on num n is actually not so helpful. And in a second, we're going to return it to just num underscore again. Uh, but yes, this is just a convenient notation for saying, okay, I want to just treat the happy path, which is the path where I actually get a bit, uh, and otherwise I do this other thing, which in this case is just failing by returning nothing. So, okay, let's change this back to an underscore. We don't care exactly what went wrong. Um, and the num that we had before is only these two cases um, and the bit is the case we want. Okay, so now we actually have a bit so we can do an ordinary semantic if then else on it. This is the if then else of Agda, not the if then else of our expressions and in each case we can ev just evaluate the branch of once. In the true case we evaluate ET, in the false case we evaluate EF. Okay, let's look at some examples. So the first thing we can do is we can evaluate example one that we had before, right? So what is example one? Well, okay, so uh, it produces a maybe well, so let's fix that. Okay, so now we defined it and then we can actually try to normalize it. So let's do that and let's see what happens. So example one was num uh, five plus num seven. Uh, so what happens if we evaluate that? Well, before we do that, let's change example three a little bit because I want to make a point. Uh, and let's put example two here in the true case that we shouldn't really catch because we're saying if false, right? Okay, but first let's evaluate example one to see that something works. And what happens? I type it in and I get just num 12, right? What is 12? 12 is five plus seven. So we have successfully evaluated the syntactic plus into a semantic plus in a way. Okay, now let's do the same thing with example two. And let's see what happens. Uh, okay. I if I used the wrong command, but uh, okay, and then I just evaluated example two, not eval of example two, and if I do that, uh, then I get nothing here, right? So that failed in a way. I tried to add true to seven, uh, which if you want, resulted in a runtime error, right? And now if I try to do the same with example three, so first I just typed in three, that was a mistake, I wanted example three, then we see that even though we have example two as a sub-expression here, uh, we didn't actually evaluate that part because our if then else did not first evaluate all the pieces and then decide which one to use. We first evaluated the bit and then we decided to only evaluate the thing we needed. Uh, and that's the same principle as if you're launching missiles. You don't want to say launch the missiles and then see if we needed to launch them or not. Uh, that's what this if then else is doing here, right? The fact that the eval is inside the if then else rather than happening in the do block beforehand. Uh, so that, that's something to look out for if you have effectful things. So here the effect is just crashing because we, we try to do something stupid. Uh, then you do want uh, to only evaluate things when you need them rather than just doing it and getting all the side effects just in case. Uh, so this is a very simple example of that, of course, but then th this remains important if we scale up to bigger things. And if then else, there's nothing special about if then else, it's just defined here in the standard library by pattern matching in the first argument. Uh, so Agda itself doesn't really care about this order of things. It's really because when we are defining this, we're doing it in the maybe monad and 
that implicitly decides the ordering of things, right? So we would do the evaluation outside if we did it in the do block, just like we did above for the plus, where we definitely evaluate E, we definitely evaluate E prime, and then we add them together. We could do the same thing here with ET and EF, but that would be the wrong thing in a way because it would mean that we would crash even if at runtime we, we're never touching that particular branch of, of the execution. So by doing the evaluation inside of DF here, we are uh, trying to be a little bit more economical with without crashing. Okay, so you could think that this is as good as we can, as it gets. So we had to use maybe uh, because there were some things, but this is really working on the garbage in garbage out principle, right? Where uh, this is not quite as bad as just producing real garbage when we go out, but we're still producing nothing if we get garbage in, right? And, and that's okay sometimes, but it's quite annoying, especially since our evaluation function here uh, really was quite verbose with all these different maybes. We, we help with the do notation, but it's still not great, right? Um, so instead, let's see if we can fix this so we don't have any garbage coming in. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to copy the old expressions and then we're going to fix them up a little bit. Uh, and how do we make sure we have no garbage? Well, we're going to make sure that there are some types. Uh, so the first thing we do, we copy the old things. Okay. And now we are going to index our expressions by their types. So we're making a new uh, data type of types, ty. And just like vectors were indexed by the natural numbers, the length, we're now going to index the expressions by types. And we make up what the types are. So we're going to have two types. First one we're going to call num. This is the type of numbers. The second one is bit, the type of bits. And we could write them on one line like this, but we could also actually make it clearer if we write them on two separate lines. We say num is a type and bit is a type, right? On a new line like this. Okay, so now we have two types, and now we can index our expressions with types. So I think the first thing we're going to do is we're going to rename our expression texpr for typed expressions. Uh, I'm sure we're going to get there in a second. So here we go. Uh, we are doing a search and replace. We're replacing expr with expert okay and then we are doing that everywhere um, including a little bit further down into the file um, which we'll get to on first day okay so we just renamed the file but now we are going to index it by the types so so far everything is the same so the first thing we say is that this is not just a set anymore, it's a set for each type. So uh, if you're looking for types, expressions of type num, uh, then we get the type. And if you're looking for expressions of type bit, then we get a set or a type. Uh, so now what we have to do is we have to look at each one of the old constructors, num, bit, plus, and if, then else. And we have to say what should be the types of them, right? And some of them are easy, and some of them we have to think a little bit more. So let's see. Uh, okay, uh, so we have these two different types, num and bit. And now let's see if we can just uh, refine the old type. So if we have a num, then that is almost by definition a number, right? So here we are going to put num as a type very soon, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, very soon. Here we go. Uh, the type of num is num, with a capital N, so it's not too confusing. And bits are bits, so they are also it's not so hard to see what the type should be. Uh, but now for plus and if then else, we have to think just a little bit more. Maybe it's not too hard, but it's not completely. Uh, it's not completely obvious, right? It's not that the type of plus is plus. Um, 
So what is it? Well, we have to say what the types of the things coming in are and what the type of the thing going out does. Uh, and we said before that it only really makes sense to add numbers, right? So we should have a number coming in, another number coming in, and then we know that there's a number going out. So here we can see the, the no garbage in, no garbage out policy, right? If we get two numbers in, then we know that we're going to produce a number out. Uh, so everything is fine. Okay, so what about if then else? Well, the first one is not so hard. So the type of the conditional really should be a Boolean, a bit, right? So we can say that that's a bit. There we go. But what about the other things? So here, a priori, it looks like we have a few different options, right? Uh, and the options are not just to say num or bit. We could also say, well, it doesn't really matter what these things are, right? So the first thing we could try is we could say that type of the first expression is R, the second one is S, and the last one is T. But this doesn't really make sense, right? Because we would like to reduce an if then else where we know that the first bit is true, that should reduce to the first argument, to the, the one that we have here given type R. So that really means that the R and the T should be the same in that case, right? And similarly, if the bit is false, then we would like the whole thing to reduce to the second argument, the one we have set as type S. So that means that the S and the T should be the same. Uh, so we can't really have three different things, but we can have one different thing. It doesn't matter, really matter what this T is. So we can say, well, as long as it's T everywhere, then it's okay to say for all T, which is a type, right? And note that we can afford to leave this implicit because most of the time this is going to be inferred by, by the uses of the different places, right? Uh, so we say, it doesn't matter what the T is, but it has to be the same everywhere. And the first thing definitely has to be a bit, right? Okay, so let's see if we could even dare to load this file and see what happens. Okay, so we've declared the fix it to declarations twice. That, that's a bit annoying. So we can comment these out or actually we can just actually delete them. And why can we do this? Well, we have the same kind of constructors in both ones, right? So they should also have the same fixities. Remember that the fixities tell us how, how to bracket things implicitly and so on. Let's just delete them and then, then it's fine. So the file loads, uh, that's great. Let's see if we can maybe write some examples. Could that be something we dare to do? Uh, so we have the old examples, and some of them should work, and some of them should not work. Right. So the first one, which was 5 plus 7 before, uh, this should still work, and it should have type num. Right. So let's see. So we say num is something plus something. Okay, and then we load the file. If only we knew where the control key was on this keyboard. Um, okay, try again. Okay, it loads, right. And we see that because we wanted the whole thing to be a num, we now have two sub goals and they definitely have to be nums. So we can say five, that's a number, and seven is a number, right. So that example worked, same as before. Um, what if we try the second example, which was something like true plus seven, I believe? Yes. Uh, what happens if we try to, to enter this example? So this is typed example two. Uh, well, okay, it's a plus, so we want it to be a num again. Uh, text two, and it's something plus seven. Okay, that's great. No problem so far. But now, if we try to give true here, then let's see what happens. Uh, okay, if we just try to see what is the type of this, then, then Agda doesn't know because bit is overloaded, so it could be many things. But we can just try and give it, and then we get an Agda type error, which said that uh, I wanted a t expert of num here, but you have given me a t expert of bit, and bit is not the same thing as num. So we get an Agda type error that stops us from record set doing stupid things, right? Um, whereas before, in the untyped version, then nothing stopped us from doing stupid things. Uh, we could just do it, but it really made no sense, right? Uh, okay, so let's see if we can do example three from before. Well, we shouldn't 
because example three has example two as a sub expression, right? But we can fix that. So copy it in here and change the name of it and change the type of it. And again, let's say that we want this to be a num. Okay, and instead of this thing that didn't make, we can do a uh, type example one, which is a num, right? And if we reload, we see that it just works. Magic. Well, not magic, it just makes sense, right? Okay, so the examples work, well, the ones that we care about anyway. Example two did not work, but, but example two was very suspicious to start with, so that's probably for the best. Uh, let's see if we can write an evaluation function. But first, let's make some more mistakes. First one being how to use the keyboard, of course. Um, after we've done that, well, it's also hard to click on this close button. There we go. Um, what if we put a bit true here? So it's kind of the same as before, and we get a very similar error message. It says that bit is not num, right? But here it's it's interesting to see what you are blamed for, right? So what what's wrong here? Agda says that this first argument is wrong. So it's happy with the bit false. That's definitely a expression of type bit. Uh, but here, because we declare that the top level thing is a num overall, then that kind of pushing downwards and saying that uh, both of these branches needs to have the same type as the top expression. If we leave it as a, as a figure it out yourself, uh, then here instead Agda blames the second argument now because it doesn't know what the top expression is. That's yellow. That means I don't know. Um, but then it's checking it left to right. So it's happy with a bit true, but then it's not happy with, with the num2 because that's, that's not the same. Right? Uh, and really can't figure out which one it's supposed to be. So let's change this back. And let's also change this back because that's the error we have. And we change it back to this. Okay, order is restored. But now let's see if we can also evaluate these kind of expressions. So the first thing we have to do is we have to decide what our values should actually be, right? So before our values, we asked a big lump of natural numbers and booleans put into one thing. But this time we can be more precise and we can say, what are the values of a given object level type? So we define this tval function for type values, which says for a given type, what is the set of values? And how do we do it? Well, we can just pattern match on the type as usual. So we see what is tai? It's either going to be num or bit. These are the two values of type tai. And what's the value if we have a num? Well, then we could say that this should be an agda level natural number, right? So this is something meta, something semantic in a way. So here we can type in backslash b n for blackboard n. That's the agda type of natural numbers, right? And similarly for bit, we can say we can use the agda type of booleans. So we are really saying, translating how, uh, translating object level types into meta level types, where meta level means at the agda level now, right? So we're saying that the object num becomes the meta natural numbers and the object bit becomes the, the meta booleans. And that, that's precision is exactly what's going to make everything so nice for us. So, uh, after we define this, then we can now go on and actually define our evaluation function. So, but the first thing we have to s figure out what the type of it should be, right? So before it was just say taking expressions to maybe values. This time we don't have any maybe anymore, but we index it by the type. So we say for every uh, little t, which can be implicit, it's going to be figured out from the rest. If I have an expression of type t, then I'm going to get a value of type t. So before we were translating object to types to object to, to meta types. Here we are now translating object expressions to meta expressions, right? Values. And how do we do that? Well, again, there's only one game in town. It's going to be to pattern match on the expression. So we're not pattern matching on the type that's left implicit. We are just pattern matching on the expression. Um, okay. And the way that this is going to work so nicely is exactly that, that we have this precise relationship between the, the type and the expression. So let's pattern match on E. Okay, we get the cases like before. 
and we do the renamings like before, so prefer a prime, prefer ET and EF rather than subscripts. And just to be polite, it would be nice if we change the X's to be M's and B's, depending on if they are natural numbers or, or booleans. So let's do that. Okay. And now we can start translating. So if we have been given a number, then we have to produce something of type T val num, because we said that the object type of a num was, was num, right? Confusingly. Uh, but T val num is just a natural number, and we have a natural number, so we can return that. And similarly here, we have something of T expressive bool, and we have to produce a T val bool, so we can just return the boolean we've been given. Uh, just exactly set up so that it works. And now here we're going to see how nice this is going to become because uh, the type of a uh, object plus is num again, right? So we have to produce a natural number. Uh, so we can just do recursive calls on E and E prime. They are also necessarily uh, expressions of type num. And then we can just add them together. No maybe nonsense, uh, no separate definition of plus or anything like this. We just take do recursive calls and then combine them in a natural way. Similarly, if we do an if then else, then we can just do an if then else at the meta level where we evaluate the condition. And then let's leave two holes for now. Uh, and we know that because the condition was had object type bit, we know that when we evaluate it, we're going to get the Boolean, so it makes sense to put it there in the if. Otherwise, like that would complain, of course. And now, what do we have to produce? Well, what we have. Uh, after we have uh, figured out how to type it in. So uh, we need something of type t val t1, where t1 is this implicitly quantified uh, object type. But we have a t expression of t1, that's et, so we can just evaluate that and do the same thing in the dem branch with the ef, right? So everything works very nicely because everything is set up to work. And, and again, there is no, uh, no maybe nonsense, it's just just a value. So let's do an example. Let me do the t eval of example three. Okay, and that was a typo. We shouldn't have been example three. It should have been t x three, the typed version. So let's try that again. And then what we get is two. So not just two, it's just two, if you pardon the pun. So it's the value two, the mere value two, not anything wrapped in a maybe because we don't need maybe anymore. This evaluation function can't possibly fail. That's the beauty of, of precision. So we know that we are not going to get, to get any garbage coming in. So we know that we also don't need to produce any garbage going out. And we've em eliminated all the garbage from our function just by having these types around, which is great. And you see that the function t eval now is much nicer compared to before when we had to do a lot of do notations and strange things. Here it really is just translating pluses to pluses and if then else to if then else and so on. So it's all working great.